Welcome everybody, I'm Gabe Cohen, and this is the first episode of the Discovery Cafe TV talk show. We're going to talk about recovery in this valley, um, what's working, what's not working by people that are in the field, uh, people in recovery, treatment providers, um, and everything that comes along with it. And today I have a very special guest, a friend, a colleague, uh, Maggie. Um, Help me with your last name. It's Seldine, and Seldine. it's often misspelled, but as you will come to see, an easy way to remember how to spell my last name is it's needles backwards. Wow. Yes. Well, well that's a great segue for telling us about what you do. That's amazing. I didn't know that. Yeah, my Ellis Island Russian name just so happens to be Needles Backwards, and I am the founder and executive director of a new nonprofit in the area called High Rockies Harm Reduction. Right. And we arose out of a need to, you know, fill the service gap for not just people in recovery, but people in active use and people really struggling. And one of those things that we do not have here in the mm -hmm. valley is syringe access program. So that's one kind of limb uh, of the multi-pronged approach of High Rockies harm reduction. That's awesome. Tell me about when you said the gap, you said that's one, one thing. Tell, yeah. me, tell me the void that, that you saw that created the vision. Well, so statistically, in mm -hmm. Colorado in 2019, we had about a 70% service gap for individuals with substance use issues seeking recovery. And so what that means is for every 10 people trying to get into a treatment program, mm -hmm. only about three are going to be able to immediately do so. Wow. And even then, I don't even know how immediate that is because you get accepted to a program, you got to wait for your bed, there are all these barriers, right? That uh, data statistic actually dropped even further from you know 30% of people getting that treatment to 16% in 2020. So there's this service gap in that the services that exist in patient rehabilitation programs are kind of our number one go-to thing for mm -hmm. substance use. Even that, it's really, really difficult to access that. So what do we do for people in that interim if they are ready to get care until they can get into treatment or if they're not ready to get care? So, you know, the other things that were really needed in this valley, syringe access programs, which include sterile syringe distribution, sterile um, works distribution for smoking and snorting as well, because we'd actually like to get people away from injection drug mm -hmm. use as much as we can, first aid supplies and just sterile equipment in general, and also syringe collection and disposal. And this is fascinating because this is something that's been a big focus in this area. A lot of people in public health are very concerned about this, and we have started to see some syringe disposal containers in some public bathrooms in city markets, Grand River Health, the hospital and rifle they have a big big disposal unit right next to their ER but even people who have diabetes and are legally prescribed syringes don't necessarily have a way to dispose of hmm. those syringes so it's way more than just syringe distribution and disposal for injection drug users but also for people who have diabetes or who are doing hormone treatment or any other you know medication that mm -hmm. needs an injection there's not a lot of options in the valley to to get rid of that and then the other two major things that we do at High Rockies Harm Reduction are Narcan distribution and education. Here in the Valley, all of our police departments now carry Narcan, so it's definitely getting out there, but we believe that it really needs to be in every American medicine cabinet, just like opioids and anxiety medications are. So tell us, tell us about Narcan for the people that don't know what that is, because you actually introduced me to it about a year ago when we did some work together. Um, train me for to use it. Um, let's tell the viewers why it's so important. Yeah, and it's so fascinating because even I, this is I can't really remember when I first learned about it, but mm -hmm. I feel like it's still relatively new to me mm -hmm. for how many people I've lost in my life to overdose. Mm -hmm. 
So Narcan is the brand name of the nasal spray. The generic drug is naloxone, and it also comes in an injectable form. And this is a drug that reverses opioid overdoses. That's all it does. It doesn't do anything else to you if you don't have opioids in your body. But what it does is it's an antagonist for opioids. Uh -huh. So it comes into those brain receptors and kicks out the drugs and binds and blocks that receptor for a limited period of time, effectively reversing the respiratory suppression and overdose. Wow. So, saving lives. Absolutely, saving lives. And that's why all of our police and EMS carry it and save lives, I would say, at least every month in our wow. rural communities. And I just want to add that, yeah. so it only reverses opioid overdoses. Um, benzodiazepine, anti-anxiety medication, and alcohol overdoses can look very similar to an opioid overdose, but that's heroin or prescription painkillers like oxycodone, oxycontin. However, this really, really strong opioid fentanyl, mm. which is a white powder, is now being found in cocaine, in methamphetamine, in MDMA, mm. specifically here in the valley in fake Xanax and fake blue Perk 30s. And then we also see it in heroin. We see it everywhere. And so it's becoming even more imperative that everyone carry Narcan because you're doing a bump of cocaine at the bar on Friday night. It could be fentanyl, which is a hundred times stronger than morphine. There's car fentanyl, which is a thousand thousand times stronger than that. And so these substances are becoming increasingly dangerous and we're losing people accidentally. That's and so insane. Narcan can reverse these overdoses and save these lives. Well, thank you for, for what you're doing. Um, why don't you tell us, I know that, I think there was a third thing. There was another point you want to make. Um, why don't you make that point? And then so, I have a question. Thank you. Yeah. yeah so yeah. not to be forgotten. Yeah, absolutely. Peer recovery support services. Yeah, here, here. Which we are not the only ones doing at High Rockies Harm Reduction, but we're very committed to not only um, expanding the peer workforce, but you know, really just strengthening awareness about what peers can do for people. And so we really want to get volunteers, help people get their GEDs, help people get awesome. whatever continuing education if they want to become a peer or get their you know clinic addiction, whatever the technician now I think yeah, is what it's, it's, it's called. Yeah. Um, but whatever you know path they right. want to take and they can work for Discovery Cafe, they can work for High Rockies Harm Reduction, they can work for some other right. RCO or Behavioral Health Center. We don't care. We just believe so strongly in peer support sure. and really getting more peers out there and connecting people with this really compassionate and life-saving care. Well, that's, I'm glad you said all that because that's a, another great segue for the question I did want to ask. And that was um, about your own personal lived experience. And when we talk about peer-to-peer -peer support, recovery coaching, what qualifies us or people in recovery um, to become peers in this field is our lived experience. So why don't you tell us um, your motivation for getting into the work that you do and why you're so passionate about it? Yeah, well, my personal experience is, of course, so much of what drives the work that I do. And I have a lot of lived experience, both in my personal life and mm -hmm. familial life, with substance abuse, mental health issues, all of that that most of us deal with on a pretty regular basis. And a lot of these familial, cyclical mm -hmm. issues of violence and addiction. Mm -hmm. But really, the, the major point in my life was losing my mother to a heroin mm -hmm. overdose when I was 15 in Carbondale. And we didn't know about Narcan. We didn't know about naloxone. We had no idea what to do. Did it exist? It did happened? exist. It did exist. Sadly, it was actually invented in the 60s. Wow. And it's, you know, used clinically from time to time. Uh, I actually heard recently that they'll use it in infants that are born with drugs in their system not because the mother was drug addicted, but because the nurses give the mothers fentanyl during labor. Oh my, my immediate question is, could you not give them fentanyl? But that's not for me to wow. judge. Yeah. Um, but so they, it did exist. And I even recently had somebody tell me that EMS in Carbondale has actually been carrying it since 2004. So that was a little frustrating for me to, to be told because we took her 
I don't even remember where, but to some medical facility in Carbondale. Did you say 2015 when your mom passed away? She passed in 2006, okay, in early sorry. 2006, so uh, quite a while ago. Uh -huh. And we tried to take her to some medical facility, and they basically, in Carbondale, told us to take her to Valley View. Wow. And so it's really hard because, you know, what's really critical in these situations is how long the person has gone without oxygen. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. And so yeah. we don't really have any idea how long she was unconscious for right. or unresponsive for mm -hmm. and she was revived and she was actually in a coma for several months but she never came back from that and we ultimately had wow. to pull the plug oh, I'm and sorry, Maggie. So that, I mean, I was already, you know, living with, my mother was a drug addict and an alcoholic and a drug dealer, and I was, you know, in and out. Were I was you actively really, using at that time? Yes. I, so that time of my life, when I was 15, was very interesting because my mother and all of my friends and myself were all injection drug users. Wow. My father was an injection drug user. He left in mid-2005 and, and got clean and stayed away, but... Um, we were all using substances, so like we would never know who was calling from the jail because it's either my friends or mom's friends or both. And I wasn't living with my mom. I actually, she had given my grandfather um, legal rights over me mm -hmm. um, a year before she passed away oh. because that's how, and that was when right. my dad she had was left. Sick. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And she was sick her whole life. Aww. She had very serious mental health issues, I think, from birth. She lost her mother to cancer when she was 14. She had a lot of trauma and a lot of, and she was in therapy, you know, but whatever it was, she, she just, she really had a lot of pain that she could not handle. And so first it was alcohol. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was, when she conceived me, it was meth, and then you know she got kind of kind of sober when she mm -hmm. was pregnant, and then alcohol and cocaine, and then later in my life heroin. So yeah, by the time you know I lost my mom, I was already very active in my own addiction and injecting cocaine and speed balls and drinking every wow. day, and really you know doing whatever I could get my hands on except for cannabis and hallucinogens. Because really? to me, I was like, that's not fun like right. that's like sounds like something you use to like grow and expand your mind or something I don't know about all that I just wanted to party and so um actually in a in a you know bittersweet way losing my mother was a, a really strong turning point in my life because it allowed me to leave the area because my grandfather had parental control of me but he wasn't around he lived in California so I'd pretty much been on the streets wow. Um, before my Parental mom Parental control, but, but you weren't even in his custody, huh? Yeah, which wow. my friend the other day was like, I think he broke some laws there, but, you know, God love him. And, and I had financial support, and that mm -hmm. was the one thing that I had. I never had, you know, emotional parental support when I was growing up, mm -hmm. at least not to the degree, like, to a, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And, but I had, you know, because I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, and I'm really fascinated in childhood development, and that is the thing that saved my life was I didn't have people, but at least I had a means to feed so, myself. So you graduated high school and then went to college? Well, <laughs> I got my GED when I was 16. So right wow. after my mom passed, this is well, a very, everything with me is very convoluted. But so well, after she passed. Share as much or as little as, as you're comfortable. Well, I don't mind sharing. I just don't want to bore. But so. After she passed, they, everyone knew I was going to drop out. So I actually have a high school diploma from the Garden School, which is now Liberty Academy. Oh, wow. The most amazing people, the Millers. They were the only ones. I went to so many different schools in the Valley. And there were some good teachers and there were some bad teachers, but the Millers helped me when wow. I needed help. Wow. And at a time when, you know, I was expelled from Yampa my freshman year, like the school for right. people like me. Troubled so, teens. Yeah, yeah, and I was too troubled even for them. <laughs> and wow. the Millers really helped me. Aww. So they did give me a diploma, but my grandpa was like, you never went to high school. I want to see something real. So I wasn't old enough yet. When I turned 16, I went and got my GED. Well, good for you. <laughs> so yeah. I have both. And then many moons later when I was, went um, I went to beauty school in Denver after that. And so my mother's passing actually allowed me to get out of the valley and kind of break that, those cycles, because I have no idea where my life would have gone, yeah. you know, if yeah. she had been around. And I had a lot of other, you know, really heavy experiences around that time around losing her a lot else was going on and um i just can't imagine what my life would have been like because yeah. she was a very toxic influence and she loved me with all her heart and soul but she couldn't be a functioning right. mother because of her illness right. 
And so, yeah, I went on and then, you know, still really deep into my addiction. And so, you know, my recovery pathway is harm reduction. I love AA. I love the 12 step model and I absolutely advocate for it. And I always encourage people yeah. shop around, find the group you want. Right. But for me, harm reduction is the model that saved my life. And I always love to, to tell this little linear story. You know, when I was 18, I quit using cocaine and pills and heroin and stuff. And then when I was 19, I stopped drinking Four Locos back when Four Locos had caffeine. And then when I was 20, <laughs> I stopped drinking liquor. And then when I was 21, I stopped drinking Four Locos again. That was kind of a back and forth. And, you know, and there are slip ups, but it was really, I, I really feel like I entered recovery when I was 23 and was going through um, a divorce and was really and, and lost my job and had to move and, and all these things, you know, where I really had to ask myself, what am I doing with my life? Mm -hmm. And that is when I started going back to school. And that is when I started really digging into my stuff. And that was because of the wonderful partner I had who was a meth addict and a very, very kind, compassionate soul, not a pockmark on his face. He yeah. was fat. He was a sweetheart. But he's use meth every day and mm -hmm. I just like to share that to kind of break down that stigma of the stereotypes right. we have of people. He taught me how to cry, he taught me how to forgive my mother, and he taught me how to really start listening to myself. Sure. And I that's what I look at recovery for me is about my mental health and my quality of life. And it's a battle every single day. Sure. Even now that I have two and a half years of sobriety wow. from alcohol, from all the hard drugs. Yeah. And, um, but you know, it's still every day, it's, it's that battle for, for mental health. But so that harm reduction and that slow reduction, you know, at 23, 24, when I did start dealing with these things, I was still drinking until like, I was like, okay, am I going to be able to make it up to my bedroom, wow. you know, mm -hmm. level every night. But I wasn't drinking hard alcohol. I wasn't crashing my car and I was making right. those steps towards. And when I did finally quit drinking, I was literally having a beer a night or whatever. And it's just everyone's pathway is different. I could have right. never had just one beer 10 years ago, sure. you know, but just I slowly started coming into this awakening. Well, I like that. Um, and I really only learned the term a couple years ago when I did my recovery coach training. Um, you know, that, that we're, you're in recovery when you say you're in recovery. I love that. I mean, I never heard that before. Um, so tell me, when you say harm reduction, I mean I'm I'm in I'm a person in recovery. I'm a peer uh, recovery coach. I have a nonprofit. I I work with partners like yourself. But I'm st harm reduction. How would you explain it to somebody that that doesn't know that term? Because it's still new to me too. Yeah, and I think I hear the term like clinical harm reduction thrown around a lot. Oh, really? I'm like, what, what does there, that mean? Yeah, like in what, the medical world, you know? Okay. And so it's kind of like music where like you hear a term and you're like, okay, but what genre of that term are okay. you talking about? Right. So I just, you know, harm reduction in its most broadest sense uh -huh. is trying to reduce the harm of our everyday actions, things that we do regularly, right? So seatbelts are harm reduction, mm. helmets are harm reduction, condoms, face masks. These are all examples of just kind of general public health harm okay. reduction, right? In terms of opioid use, the, there's kind of three pillars of harm reduction. And again, so this mentality is people are going to use substances. Since I was 11 years old, I wanted to be a sex ed teacher with the mentality that people are going to have sex and use drugs. We cannot stop that. But right. we can give people the tools to do those things safely Keep themselves safe. and be educated and informed about the decisions. Wow, when you were eleven. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a weird person. I know. No, I, that's, <laughs> it's not weird. It's just it's it's unique. I think it might be unique. I don't know. Well, and I was very lucky because my whole family, my parents, um, you know, my very aunts open. and uncles, very open and very Liberal. open about sexual yeah. education. And getting my bachelor's degree in Grand Junction, I realized what a blessing that was right. for me. And I went to you know alternative charter schools in the valley wow. and stuff. So I'm very very blessed for wow, the education that I have. Yeah. yeah, but so we're just trying to, you know, mitigate any potential harm. People are going to inject drugs, right. but if we can reduce the potential of them spreading HIV, right. every yeah, right. every one dollar spent on syringe programs saves seven dollars in taxpayer money by preventing HIV specifically, just because wow. of the cost. And of that's one just an case. economic issue. I mean, I, you know. It, 
but it's saving lives. Yeah, and then hepatitis right. and, yeah. you know, all of these issues in our community where, you know, could you just, it, and you look at it, it's just like taking a cab home from the bar instead of driving. That is harm reduction. Right. Go out and get wow. plastered, but don't kill someone in right. the process. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and that's why I just bring that up because I think DUIs on 82 and accidents sure. and stuff are another huge part of this issue yeah. and just kind of illustrating all the different areas that this work really branches right. off into. But basically, we can't save people if they're not alive. Every person is capable of redemption Every human right. life has I equivalent agree. value, right? Yes. And just because someone is sick or struggling doesn't mean that they're not deserving or that they're to blame. No, I, I agree, and it doesn't matter what, what they're struggling with, right? So, t so I'm curious to know how do you... I'm sure that you've met uh, critics and resistance in, in the work you're doing. The stigma of of uh, needles versus you know a marijuana joint or a powdered substance or just the whole injection um, scene, I guess, for lack of a better term, for people where that's foreign in their lives. People, how's it going in this community? How, how's it, I mean, I mean, let's just keep it real. Like, yeah. like, like you and I are both sitting here because we're in the field, uh, we're people in recovery. Um, we saw uh, uh, gaps in the current uh, systems of treatment. We know people dying from this disease of addiction. And, and we decided to step up and do something about it. So, so tell me what you're seeing in this valley today and, and uh, what do you, tell me what you're hearing that's negative about the work you're doing and, and tell me what your answers are to that negativity. Absolutely. Because I think it's important. Yeah, and just before I forget, yeah, no, because no. sometimes I just do so many wonderful things, we also provide fentanyl test strips and we're one of, we are the only organization. So what is that? And so that is a testing strip where you can test your powder, drugs, pills, whatever it is you're using, for the presence of fentanyl and then know either I'm going to throw this away wow. or I'm going to use a tenth of what I was planning on using or wow. this is what I was looking for now I know because so, that happens too. So act, so so providing this for people who are actively, who you know are actively using, they're going to use either way. Um, you're trying to save them from killing themselves by accident. So, so, so tell me what you've heard from a critic. Uh, in reference specifically to that, because I can, I already hear some things in my head, I can imagine. Well, yeah, and I think that, you know, the criticism question is a great question. Sure. Because I think it's very anticipated in this work. And right. I sometimes, I don't want to, I want to lead with my most controversial foot forward. I don't wow. want to hide what I'm doing. I'm really proud of what I'm doing. Absolutely. And I don't want it to be like, oh, well, I thought that you were just giving out free Narcan, but now you're doing this. I want to be very upfront with what we're doing. Right. But I'm always a little nervous about well, the sure. response I'm going to get. And to be perfectly honest I haven't had any in-person critics really oh wow I've had people who are upset and <laughs> they and I am uh, you know a very open what are they, person to what are they upset to. about um, upset at the system. I've had people come up to me, you know, because I do a lot of Upset with outreach. the current system that you're trying to influence? Yeah, I had a woman who was um, just mad at me. She felt like the police let her son die and you know just Angry, just angry and in pain and hurt. looking to hurt. Yeah. Looking to take it out on the exactly. system. Exactly. And just looking to vent that oh. frustration, you know. Yeah. So it, that's like it's when I think about the people who come up and yell at me, it's not people who are like, What you're doing is wrong. It's people who are saying what they're doing is wrong. And they're just looking for but a they're space mad to at vent you? that. They're, gonna they're just mad. Out? They're just mad and I'm just a sweet and person you're who open. takes it. <laughs> wow. You know. Wow. And that's what I'm here for, you know, for Aww. people and Bless your people heart. cry and people yell yeah. and people scream and you know, that's I'm just here to be calm and support them through that. But we did get a lot of negative comments online um, when we first had some, you know, presence in the newspapers and online and stuff. A lot of, lot of negative comments online. And that's just the state of the world right now. We've right. all become so isolated and we're all traumatized from the past year. And so there's a lot of anger on Facebook and on sure. postindependent.com. There's a lot, and that's where people are letting it out. But I feel like hard pressed to believe that somebody could talk to me about these issues for five minutes and still think that I was doing something wrong. Right. I'm trying to save lives and I'm using 
practices that are based on 30 years of evidence in America that have shown that they do save proven. lives. And that people are five times more likely to enter a recovery if they use these programs than injection drug Is users right? who don't. And that's from the CDC. So wow. when, you know, I feel like when I do have opposition and I've, you know, developed this plan by collaborating with and questioning and, you know, getting a lot of advice from people all over the state. Mm -hmm. So people who already run these programs in Grand Junction and Denver. Right. And as far as like, how is this work going here? They are always completely floored when I tell them like, oh yeah, this city wrote me a letter of support and this police department supports what I'm doing in Garfield County Public Health or Picking County Public Health or whomever. They're floored because of? The support, that we have this support in our community, that there is very little resistance to it here. Oh, that's great to hear. And I think it's becoming less and less the more and more we get out there. Yeah, and you just we haven't even there, been right? doing it for a year, you know. And even last year, a lot of legislation changed and mm -hmm. legislation is continuing to change yeah. around specifically syringe programs. And so I noticed that the time was ripe and then the legislation followed suit. And I think it's becoming increasingly difficult for people to ignore the severity of these issues because I think historically people want to think, oh, it's Aspen, oh, it's Glenwood, it's Carbondale, we don't have these issues. Right. And I know from personal experience that there are people in our community suffering and they're being ignored and they're being invalidated, treated like they don't exist. Aww. So yeah, a pot, uh, you know, flower pots are gonna get turned over every now and then if this is how you're treating Aww. these folks, which is something that's happened in oh, yeah, Carbondale yeah. and Glenwood quite Aww. a bit over the past couple of years. But we have so much amazing support. And like I said, yes. I get nervous sometimes. And especially when I'm emailing with people, I'm always worried that somebody is going to come back to me and say, wait, what are you doing? Can you explain this to me a little bit more? Whatever, you know. And, and I do get that from time to time. And it's difficult because the laws are kind of purposefully vague around a lot mm -hmm. of what I do to allow people to do it. But then people are hesitant. Um, and I'm like, well, this is the law. When it, when it comes down to it. Yeah, but for the most part, 95% per, of the time, instead of getting that response, I get, we 100% support what you're doing. How can we help you? Here's what we can do for you. Oh, that's awesome. And we work with police departments. Yeah. You know, We work with folks all over the valley in public health, in behavioral health, in legal services, in recovery, in peer yeah. support, people who are just you know, independently affected by this and not affiliated with organizations. We already have in like a couple weeks, a huge response for volunteers. Awesome. And so, yeah, the support here is just, it's amazing. So tell me, um, I did hear you at a meeting talk about your your mobile unit. What do you do? What is, what is that? Yeah, Where can so, people find you? Yeah, so unfortunately we weren't able to raise the money in time oh, okay. to get an actual, excuse me, vehicle for our needs assessment. But, you know, we're, again, a brand new nonprofit. Sure. And it's difficult for syringe programs to get. I didn't know get... that. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. It's, right. well, well, I'll we're tell just you, getting started. We're still doing mobile stuff. We're just getting stuff. started. Yeah. And for yeah. some reason, um, with a lot of syringe service funding, you have to be in existence for a year before okay. you can get funding. But myself, my staff, and my board, we are so committed to this work. We would do it for free if we right. had to. I'm sure you take the bus if you needed to, <laughs> exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, whatever right? we have to do. Yeah. And so we kind of created this hierarchy of needs, yeah. and we do have a fiscal sponsor awesome. on the Colorado Nonprofit Development Center, whom we chose because wow. they also oversee the Harm Reduction Action Center, which is one of the few independent syringe programs in the state. It's in Denver. Okay. It's on eight. So they already have a vested interest in the work that you're doing. Yes, and, and they, even they, I mean, it's just amazing. That's awesome because that they stepped up like that for you. Well, and I'm sure you see this a lot, Gabe, where you Tell say me. you're in recovery or you work in recovery and everyone you talk to has a story about how they're personally affected by oh, yeah. recovery, right? Yeah. This is such a pervasive issue. Yeah. And you know, be, this is kind of going off on a tangent, but my no. personal belief is that addiction is the symptom of under underlying mental oh, health yeah. issues. I mean, and yeah. so it's more than drugs and alcohol. It's food, it's TV, it's shopping, it's hoarding, you know, it's trauma. Exactly. Anything. There's there's so much more right. yeah. that goes into this than just addiction. It's just right. where we choose to to focus right. that right. energy. Sure. And what helps well, us if you're trying to save lives. Even killed. Yeah. Um, with harm reduction. So we basically, yeah, we're like, okay, what do we actually need to do this? We need a vehicle, but we can use my car. We need staff and we need them paid. And what will you do with this? Uh, so so you but you have a vehicle, what are you gonna do? So um, what we're doing right now, which we just started um, in August, is we are just taking my car around and setting up a card table 
in various cities throughout the valley. We're starting out really small with the hopes that we can branch out. Awesome. Our service area is like the valley, kind of wonky, because we want to do Aspen to Parachute, Parachute to Vail, Carbondale to Peonia. Wow, it's pretty spread out. But right now, because of the state of I-70, we just can't do sure. Eagle Vale, unfortunately. Yeah. So we are starting out with Aspen, Basalt, Carbondale, Glenwood, and Rifle. And basically we just go, we have different locations where we set up. Sometimes we're inside, sometimes we're outside. We're working on, you know, developing just winter, advocating, winterized plans. And educating. We, well, at these locations and these times, which you, you can find the whole schedule yeah. at hierarchiesharmreduction.com, we do provide full syringe services. Wow. So we have disposal, we have distribution, we have Narcan, fentanyl test strips, sterile works, uh, hygiene, water bottles, kind of whatever we have that we think our folks will need. Um, you know, and we do safe smoking supplies, lip balm, um, things to reduce the potential that you could transmit diseases through sharing smoked or sorted drugs, because wow. that is also a possibility with cracked lips and torn up nasal cavities. And of course, preventing disease is one of our number one things. And so good for you when we have again too, yeah. like, so we had this, um, so I'll just finish what we do, well, and then yeah. I'd like to tell you a story yeah. about criticism that we've received that was actually internal, kind of from our organization, oh, wow. internal criticism. Sure. But so, yeah, you're just coming from Glenwood. You were just doing this today, right? Yes, I'm perpetually sunburnt because and, I'm and out in the community. Just real quick, plug it again. How can they find out these lo these spots, these locations, days and times on your website? Yeah, so what go to again? HighRockiesHarmReduction.com right. and select the events calendar, and you'll find we do farmers markets in the summer too. So we're nice. in. Carbondale, Basalt, and Glenwood every other week. And then we're doing full syringe services in Glenwood nice. every Friday. From Our hours are always 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. wherever okay. we are. Glenwood we do every Friday and then the other cities we do alternating and again like we have different various locations so we just encourage you to check that out you can also call us go on our website follow us on social okay. media message us we can do delivery too if those hours don't work for you because wow. we are a rural syringe program and that's a big part of rural services is we have homebound people some people work nine to five some people work five right. to nine so making this accessible to everyone mm -hmm. who needs it an internal piece of yeah, criticism yeah. that was really interesting because it took me a while because I'm always learning too. I'm All always right. reducing my own stigma and educating myself because something that comes up a lot in our work is when you're in active use, like we didn't know what gauge needles we use. We didn't know what Narcan was. Right. We didn't know even maybe, you know, you can't, unknow what you already know, but like you don't know what an opioid versus a stimulant even is necessarily. You don't really care, you're just trying yeah, to get high, right? Exactly, it's not important to you. Right. And so, and then we also are affected by propaganda and stereotypes. And so I tell that story of my ex-partner, the meth addict, because I really kind of came to a place last year where I realized all these stereotypes I had about drug users, whether it was meth or right. heroin or whatever, they're not really reflective of my actual personal experiences with these individuals, which is many and very right. intimate. And, right. you know, we just kind of create these stereotypes sure. by perpetuating it because even we believe that, you know. Aw, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I think it's you a know, cool it, thing. Well, it's important. I mean, the education piece, right? Um, and I, I only asked about criticism because I think, I think it's important. I, I think it just shows um, just how bold you are, seriously. You know, I mean, I could just see you at a farmer's market. I mean, we were like immersed in the whole, you know, we did different things and we ran in different crowds. But you know, when you're in that whole drug scene and it's different at 10 o'clock in the morning, 11 at the farmer's market or, you know, mom and dad and soccer moms and, and whatever and kids. And I could just imagine um, some of the looks or some of the questions of like, why are they here? And just the fact that you suit up, show up, um, and just put the work in day in and day out. I've learned, um, for me, <laughs> it, was, it was a hard lesson, uh, is just to kill them with kindness. You know, for me, I used to I wanted I used to want to debate and and argue and be right and prove my point and and was a little aggressive, uh, and that doesn't, uh, you know, I, it made me realize that people just need to be educated, and that's just going to come, uh, and a lot of it has to do with the way I believe um, my own experience is is just how we carry ourselves in this community, 
you know, and, and, and we just keep putting our best foots, foots. We kept, we keep putting our best foot forward and, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm so proud of you and the work you're doing. Is there, is there anything, anything else that you want to talk about? Well, I'll just say Important that points. I totally agree with the kill them with kindness. I worked in restaurants for 10 years, and so that was like a big lesson you learn. Um, and yeah, you know, it's interesting because now when you say it, I think about, yeah, the, far the farmer's markets are really interesting, right? Because it's a real mix of people. There's a lot of tourists, yeah. and we're seeing a lot of awesome young people who are super educated. And that's so really? cool because that to me kind of shows like if we wow. do have people who are criticizing us, are they people who are engaged in this community because young folks and when I say young people I mean like people under 40 basically right? the people I mean these people people under 40 are very informed well, and very educated desirable in this, of this service. line of work okay yeah they okay. they understand the risk of I mean I would say one in five people under 30 that I talked to says yeah I saw an overdose and this is so important to me Lots. and so the people who are the you know statistically most likely to be using these substances 15 to 35 they see the value of this Good. and they understand its importance and they know a lot of this stuff which is awesome but it's not so much that I get criticism people who are supportive will say things that are pretty offensive oh, because hurtful? they're just uneducated right they wow. just don't know and so that's to be able to and you know being a boss right. is and like running your own company and, right. and trying to make change and be an advocate you kind of have to wear a different face than if you're oh, yeah. trying to look good down at the bar or whatever and, and, when, and you're a person in recovery you're a person who lost her mother um, to this disease and so I'm sure hearing things that can be hurtful and offensive um, is not always so easy no, but, you know, I think it is. It's just about educating them. And I even right. have clients who have said things that were really hurtful and offensive and slowly chipping and, you know, not taking that personally because it's like I'm right. not here to be your best friend. I'm here right. to be your advocate, right. you know. And so kind of slowly chipping away in those relationships and educating yeah. there too. But, yeah, I will say, you know, one of the really interesting criticisms was – we were discussing, because this is what other syringe service programs do across the state, mm -hmm. whether or not we were going to carry glass pipes. And I put it out there because I was like, this is really like just, I didn't really understand Put it out there it. like asking to if, my board. if do you think we should do this. Yeah, to okay. my board of directors, uh -huh. put it out there and was like, what do you guys think of this? You know, because I had been talking about it with some police departments and some other folks and I wasn't really fully... You know, I, I didn't 100% at this moment understand why we would do it. I just was like, that's cool. Let's do right. it. And a lot of people were like, well, I don't know about that. And some people were like, just do, you know, do, right. we, there's every town. And, th and that would the be to help, a little different, you know, but to so, help people with have clean using yeah, uh, not, materials. Right? Yes. And I literally had somebody within our organization come to me and say, I support everything we do. I do not support you giving out these pipes. But you can give out needles, but not pipes. Well, and I said to that person, thank you so much for coming right. to me and telling me this, because these are the conversations that we need to have. Right. Because when there is criticism and when there is an understanding, then we need, if, especially if it's at our level, right. we need to figure that out. Right. Right. She's on your board. Yeah. And yeah. so it was great that that person right. said that because sure. it was such an important conversation to have. And I pretty, I kind of had like an aha moment working with my staff on it. There's kind of two main reasons. And I think that, yeah, reducing transmission because you want to have a clean pipe. I mean, I'm just, and you I'm wondering, I don't know if that's the right pipe. answer. But, yeah. I mean, having uh, your own pipe, um, bu bubblers break a lot, but, right. um, for me, there's kind of two major reasons. The first reason being we want, ideally, to move people away from injection drug use because the risk of overdose when you inject drugs oh. is much higher than if you were to smoke drugs. And people absolutely inject meth. And so if we could convince an injection user to switch to smoking a drug like heroin oh, so or meth... so that's harm reduction. That would be huge. That is harm right. reduction, right? They're not... And especially because... You know, folks with little resources who are injecting, it turns into all these other medical problems. Yeah. I could go on and on about sure. why we want to keep people safe there and mm -hmm. all the problems that it creates. But basically, if you can smoke it instead of shooting it, you're going to be safer. Secondarily, it is not my place to judge how or what a person uses. My role in this community is to provide a trusting, non-judgmental, supportive place for people who aren't ready for recovery. Right. Because... I have been in that point right. in my life where nobody loves me, 
everyone's just criminalizing me, the schools, the, the sure. human services, no, you know, that. systems, the, the criminal justice system itself. Mm -hmm. Why would I do anything for society? Why would I do anything for myself if that's how I feel? My like if that's, that's what I feel like my yourself. place in society is. Yeah, is marginalized, that criminal. Yeah, exactly. Not worthy of services. Sure. Not worthy of education. Whatever you know. And so, if you can just give these people love, if someone can just feel like anyone in the world cares about whether they make it to tomorrow, yeah. that can be the difference between someone living and dying. Well, I love that you said that. Um, you know, part of our mission statement at the Discovery Cafe is we just want everybody to feel loved and valued and we leave any judgment at the door, no matter what they're going through or, or what they've done, um, just to know that they matter and they count. You know, it's. It's interesting when you're sharing about um, the glass pipe thing. I mean, I never really thought about it, you know, handing out clean, brand new glass pipes, but you're handing out needles, right? And it's to save lives, to help prevent disease. Um, it made, it, it triggered the thought of, when we rented a space in, uh, in Rifle, Colorado, and for the, to do Discovery Cafe, which is a non-clinical um, recovery community center. We got our first taste of community pushback, not in our backyard. Um, the, the, card that, the card that I felt they really, um, you know, I was getting my first education in, in running a nonprofit. I didn't know I had to check about zoning and it wasn't properly zoned for community service. Um, it was like a retail sales street. I thought it was a great location next to the bus, downtown, you know, landlord took my money. I figured, you know, he was cool with what we were doing. I didn't know I had to go to the city. Um, lesson learned. Um, he dropped us from the, the landlord dropped us from the lease. Uh, neighbors were upset about what this, the people we were going to bring to this street. Um, what really got me is like a, around the corner, a block down, there's a place selling paraphernalia. And I mean, because they're generating sales tax, because this is produced, like I'm here trying to help people and save lives. And, um, but what I wanna put, you know, down the street, a block and a half away, I can't put there. But, but these people can sell all the paraphernalia and stuff uh, for active drug use. And so it was, uh, yeah, it just made me really think about, like, what, you know, what's the motive? What, what's the, uh, what's it all about? Is it all, it's just, is it, you know, obviously it's about sales tax and right. revenue. Yeah, and it's so funny because, yeah, and then what else is on that street? Bars, you know, like yeah. less now, but yeah. it's just so interesting. Yeah. And then not in my backyard, but for the love of God, somebody do something about all this substance use and right. homelessness, right? It's like, well... Right. If you want us to do something about it, we right. need somewhere to go. And, and, you know, having said that, you know, by the way, um, and that was my first taste of, like, community pushback and, and learning about what's, what it's going to take to run a successful nonprofit um, to do the work that we want to do. We were blessed. You know, we landed at CMC Rifle Campus. Um, and we've since gotten so much community support, and I'm not knocking the city of Rifle. Um, local businesses, um, just community members. We did a fundraiser and we generated um, money and we were able to put money back into the local economy. And I, I purposely wanted to do that to show that, that you know, we're not, uh, we want to help the local economy. You know, we are providing, we've put three people to work. You know, we've, we've found people jobs. Um, we, we're helping people with their education at the college. Um, you know, just all around, I, uh, I just, I guess the policies, right? And, and it's, again, it's about, um, I believe if we just keep putting our best foot forward and, and letting people know that, that we're doing this because we actually care about our community. You know, we do. We care about, about the children that are going to grow up and have to face the issues that we faced. I mean, I got addicted to cocaine when I was 15 years old you know, and started using drugs and, and um, you know, it's the perception, I think, from a lot of people.
people that aren't drug addicts or alcoholics um, when they see people like ourselves doing community outreach to help uh, addicts and alcoholics or just people suffering from mental health issues, um, it, it's foreign to them and they don't understand why uh, like we're putting this in their face. And, and I think a lot of people uh, fail to realize that, that these are, are everyday issues and that no demographic, no, you know, uh, it doesn't matter. Depression, mental health uh, issues, uh, drug addiction, alcoholism, it's in our neighborhoods. Uh, one of the business owners was so mad. He's like, you're going to have felons and drug addicts down here. And, and, uh, and I said, if you, you know, I, and that was at the time, you know, I became a treatment provider for the parole department. And I, I said, they're already here. Like, like, if you had any idea, I mean, they're right in your neighborhood. They're on this block already. Yeah. You know, and so it's just, you know, it's, it's the fear. And, and, and that's where advocacy and education, um, and thus, that's why we're sitting here right now doing this, because we're going to put it out there. Yeah. And hopefully some people will listen, and, and if we can have more conversations like this. Absolutely. And my, you know, final word on sure. it. Sure. Yeah, no, that, yeah, sure. Syringes and you know, glass pipes, this is scary to people, especially if they don't have experience with it. Sure. But the bottom line, and I think what is becoming more apparent to more and more people, because now we have our attorney general and all of these professionals out there saying it, is that what you're doing is what we need to be doing. What I'm doing is what's oh, working other places. Thank you. And so I think, and that's, you know, I agree, and that's what the Attorney General is saying. And that's so awesome. for our commissioners to hear that, and for our communities to hear that, it's like, yeah, we don't want it to be Seattle or Portland. That's the whole point, is we right. don't want We're trying to let to, that happen. Right, take care of our community, do our part, you know, give back, right? And it Absolutely. Gives, uh, for me, it gives uh, meaning to the wreckage of my past, you know? And, and uh, yeah, I was at a, we went to a Rockies game, a sober, uh, sober entertainment event uh, last weekend, and uh, we went to a sober tailgate party at the Phoenix Gym in Denver, and it was awesome, and they had different speakers there, and one of them was, was somebody from the DEA, and, and she had said that um, overdoses, there's more overdoses now, overdose deaths, in Colorado than there are murders by um, firearms. Oh my gosh. She said that's, that's a current statistic and that one in, one in four pills, counterfeit pills, contain a lethal dose of fentanyl. So one in, one in four. And, and um, I didn't know that. Yeah, I wish I could give you the exact, exact numbers, yeah. but I can tell you yeah, I don't know. that yeah. in 2019, well, and this has been kind of like 100% or 200% increase over the past four years. What just was that again? Fe- so 100%? Fentanyl, for fentanyl specifically, yeah. so like 2018, for example, there was like 100 plus fentanyl overdoses. In 2019, in Colorado, uh-huh. in 2019, there was 220 fentanyl wow. overdoses. Uh-huh. In 2020, there were over 500 fentanyl overdoses in Colorado. Wow. And 2021, we already, I think you and I both know, we kicked this year off strong in our yeah. communities with a lot of overdoses. Just in this valley. Yeah, and these are just the overdose, you know, these numbers are just the ones that are reported, the person died, and there was an autopsy. So it's still only a wow. fraction of the actual fentanyl overdoses that are happening in our community because yeah I get calls from our police departments all the time and we just recently had because you Mm -hmm. see these in cities all over the country we had a fentanyl alert warning in rifle because there was an increase of overdoses just in a 24-hour period and that's what you see a lot with fentanyl is one batch enters a community and literally tens of people die in 24 hours so it's pretty scary powerful stuff yeah. yeah. And, and I think we should talk about, and, and I don't know if one thing has anything to do with the other, but I noticed the purple hair. Oh, yeah. I noticed the, the purple strap. Um, we have an event coming up, and I think we should certainly mention um, about Emily. And, 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 and the overdose awareness. Yeah, absolutely. So, but I'll let you lead on that. Yeah, so well, August in general is Overdose Awareness Month with yeah. 
August 31st being International Overdose Awareness mm -hmm. Day. And so the ribbon color for opioid overdose specifically is purple. Okay. So that's why I've gone full purple. It's not purple. a coincidence, right? It's not a coincidence. Right. It right. is very purpose on work. My nails, my hair, my Oh, even your nails. Strap. I didn't yeah, see that. Yeah, they're, they're fading. I got to right. reapply and re-dye before the 31st <laughs> because... Then yeah, the, we have the purple flags all over. The, yeah, just I saw them. Yeah, just regular overdose ribbon is just silver, so silver okay. or purple. Okay. So we've got yeah the 72 purple flags and one white flag symbolizing these are the overdose deaths in Garfield, Eagle, and Pickin County over the past three years. Wow. Last year when um, this group did that, it was I believe 54 flags. So again, you can see that increase wow. yes. just in our communities. And I know so yeah, 2020 there was some significant increases in some of our counties. And uh, very sad. And you know, the amazing Kath Adams is yes. putting on this event at Crown yeah. Mountain Park on the 31st from 5 to 7 p.m. in Algebel. And her daughter Ashley has been really involved. Yeah. And their story is just so powerful. Uh, I hate to take it from them, but you know, sure. her uh, Kath's daughter, uh, I, I want to say she was 20, she was a young woman, mm -hmm. she was sober, she had been in recovery, she had been in treatment. Um, she was somebody who lived with a lot of pain mm. mental and physical pain I can tell you as a chronic pain patient are completely inseparable and it is so difficult yeah. I literally was just told by a doctor for like the tenth millionth time in my life that modern medicine cannot treat my pain which Aww. that's always fun to hear right, right. Oh, and I'm so sorry. these this is just this you know my I only share that because my story is a million stories people with pain have no recourse and so Emily had a slip up and unfortunately, when she tried to get a Percocet, it was fentanyl, and she died alone in her car. Oh, and it's wow. such a tragedy. This was just I in didn't know April. That. This, the of exact circumstances of it, but I knew she lost her daughter. Yeah, and this was April 2020, and I just feel like I've done wow. so much April. work with Kath over this past year mm -hmm. because you know I lost my mother, and she lost her daughter, and so we really have yeah. developed this very kindred relationship. Yeah. You know, she's a mentor, a friend. She's so much to me, and I just feel like. I'm close enough with her that I can feel comfortable sharing sure. Emily's story. Well, they, they re it's actually so reached out. We're going to have a table there. We'll, we'll yeah, see you there. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, we'll be there. We support. And I'll be doing you know. Narcan training and speaking awesome. at that event as well. I will be doing Narcan training and speaking at any event that they'll have me. Well, bless their hearts for doing the work they're doing. And they just had an a article, and I think it was at the Post Independent, I saw it, right, with, with Ashley and, and Kath. Planting the flags. Oh yeah, I think so. Yeah. I don't, I've been backed up, backlogged yeah. on my well, newspaper reading. Yeah. <laughs> well, on some days, like you check the newspaper every single day, and you got to take a break. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. No. Political environment. So. Actually, the 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 purple flag is is what caught my attention, and I was at I was downtown at the courthouse, and I saw the purple flags there, and I thought that was really cool. So. Yeah, yeah, and again, just work. shows the community support that they're, you know, all the way from the Aspen Courthouse all the way down to yeah. uh, the Glenwood High School. They're all over. And I don't know if there's any in Rifle, but... Um, you know, I haven't seen any. I just think it's so great that there are so there many... There may be, though. I mean, I don't know. Well, I think yeah. um, something that somebody said is, you know what it means when you see all these nonprofits sprouting up all of a sudden, right? It right. means that the system is broken, that whatever right. we're doing isn't working. Because somebody else once told me too that the goal of any nonprofit is to not exist, right? And wow. yeah, if we could not exist, right. if, I truly believe that this work can bring our counties to zero HIV, you know, new uh, rates of HIV, zero new cases of hepatitis, zero overdose deaths. But that doesn't mean that we That's can a great ever to... go away, you know? Right, right. Because well, that education right. and awareness is always sure. going to be there. Yeah. Um, and it's just, so great to see so many really passionate people doing this work yeah. and everyone's focus on the Roaring Fork Valley as an extended community. Well, Maggie, you know, I, uh, I just put out some emails this week and, and wanted to get this, this show going and, and you were the first one to jump in right away. I thank you so much for coming here today and, uh, yeah, I look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks so much for what you do in this community. Thanks so much for yeah. having me, Gabe. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure. Thank you.